Hello, everyone. I recorded three videos yesterday. Uh, that was on Sunday, February 4th, and I processed them overnight. Uh, took a few hours. I actually went to sleep while they were processing. That seemed to work okay. And then I posted the videos early in the morning. And I already have a comment on um, the video on my digression, <laughs> which was from a comment on a previous, uh, you know, R6RS report um, video. And so the comment that I started the digression on was asking, what's the difference between a proper tail call and a tail call? Why not just say tail call, right? And I thought that was a good question and I wanted to understand the answer to that better. So I started going down that path and very quickly I realized that while the R6R RS report um, talks about tail calls and talks about proper handling of tail calls, at some level, it also points to this paper from Will Klinger and PLDI 1998 for the formal definition. Okay. Um, and so here I have a comment from an implementer of Iron Scheme. And so that's great whenever you have an implementer giving a comment. That's great because I, I've written a couple of scheme compilers, but nothing, you know, those were exercises, right? These were not uh, implementations that people actually use. So here we go. A scheme implementation is properly tail recursive if it supports an unbounded number of active tail calls. And I think that's coming from the report. Let's see. Um, doo -doo. Mm. Yeah, here we go. Proper tail recursion. Implementations of scheme must be properly tail recursive. A scheme implementation is properly tail recursive if it supports an unbound, um, unbounded number of active tail calls. Okay, so that is the definition. Um, now, this is not a super formal definition, and you probably have to think about it quite a bit, or have experience, or read papers, or have implementation experience, or talk to other implementers to really understand all the implications of that. But that is a sentence from the R R6RS, that's true. Um, all right. Some implementations may have faster or slower tail calls. And I remember my friend Aziz, who did um, Icarus uh, scheme, which ended up being forked and turned into Vicari scheme, uh, telling me that as well. In Iron Scheme running on .NET CLR, tail calls are slow. Uh, as an optimization and still being properly tail recursive, you could ignore a tail call if there is not an unbounded number of active tail calls. Example, in most implementations, the two argument plus procedure does not have an unbounded number of active tail calls. The implementation can thus uh, call it normally or as a tail call. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for the comment. Um, so, so this, this comment about plus uh, got me thinking a little bit. So let's just try something real quick. You know, so certainly in R5 and I think in R6, you know, plus is very attic. It, you know, the definition of plus in the spec. Uh, plus can take any number of arguments. So it can take zero, you know, um, one argument, two arguments. Uh, many arguments. Now, um, just because plus is very attic doesn't mean that there isn't a built-in binary plus. So I'd actually like to expand the different different versions of these and see if if Shay is doing something that we can see. I mean, we could also look at the assembly output. Okay, so look at that. That that looks uh, all right. So that's some sort of built-in. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Yep, yep. Okay. All right. 
Now the question I have, is there anything special for the two argument version? I don't see any difference here. Now maybe, maybe the optimizer does something different. Um, well, let's uh, grab the magic. All right, let's look at the magic here. So let's let's look at the uh, plus with no arguments. <clears throat> okay, got some sort of label it looks like. All right, we have an X or. Uh, I guess these are two abstract uh, registers, like accumulator registers. I'm guessing. We've got a jump to something off of, I don't know, is this, is this a frame pointer? Uh, jumping to zero bytes off of, I don't know what, the, I don't know if it's a stack pointer or a frame pointer, SFP. Um, okay, and then that's the end of it. All right, so um, not a lot going on there. So let's try uh, doing plus of five. See what that does. Okay, move immediate. Okay, and then the jump. Five, six. <clears throat> mm. Okay, I'm not seeing an addition, so I think it's actually the uh, optimizer, I think it's done the addition. I don't know, I might do it this as well. Actually, here, let me let me do it this way. Um, is there a way I can defeat that? Oh yeah, okay, let's, we can do it this way. M to X, Y, uh, plus X, Y. So it's not gonna be able to optimize that to constants. Let's see what gets generated there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, well, we got this Lambda, uh, wow. <laughs> that was more complicated than I thought, to be honest. I guess I'm not super surprised, but there's got to be some sort of add, right? It's got to be some sort of addition. Uh, uh, where's an addition? Okay, here's an add immediate. All right, there's our addition. All right, so we're setting up the arguments uh, used by the addition, I think is what this is. <laughs> All right. Well, um, okay, that's a little too into the weeds. Mm. So we can see what it, you know, it doesn't look like the expander is doing anything special recognizing the two argument plus um, but it also it does look like the optimizer the cp0 pass is uh, being smart when it can stick in content constants uh, and avoid the add and the lambda just adds enough complexity that i don't know maybe there's a a smart way to see a little bit more easily what shay is doing here but in any case uh, okay the, this does match my understanding that there can be faster or slower whole, um, handling of proper tail calls. Okay, so so the proper tail call is about supporting an unnum uh, unbounded number of active tail calls. Um, it's not about whether or not it's fast to do so. This is this is about you know uh, memory usage. Will you, will you run out of memory by doing this? Will you um, you know run out of uh, <clears throat> stack space if you have a single infinite recursive call to, you know, to a function, that kind of thing, um, where the arguments don't grow. Okay. So, um, so in, in the iron scheme implementation, the, the, the tail calls, or so, so the iron scheme implementation is properly recursive, but the tail calls are slow. All right. And then this is an optimization. So, 
As I understand it, this optimization reminds me a lot of the notion in continuation passing style of serious versus simple calls that if you have some arbitrary function you're calling that is recursive, like you're, you write an interpreter, like your own eval, uh, and you make a call to eval, well, there's no guarantee that's not going to go in infinite loop. So you better, you know, make sure any, any call to eval and tail position, this is treated properly. Uh, but if you're calling, you know, like a build in like the two argument plus, then you know you're never going to, um, you know, at least for some uses of plus, uh, you know, you, you're never going to run out of stack space. Um, so you can just go ahead and, and uh, you know, sort of treat that naively because you're only going to allocate like two stack frames or three stack frames or whatever. Um, so you're not going to run out of space. You're, you're, you know, then that call to plus will return and, and that kind of thing. That reminds me of how when you're CPSing a program like an evaluator that maybe has a lookup for for um, looking up variables in the environment, you can say, well, yeah, true, lookup is recursive. However, I know the environment's always going to be length instantiated. It's always going to be finite. So lookup can't go in an infinite loop in the, the correct uses of it. So I don't really have to CPS it. I can just treat it as simple, even though it's recursive. And so that's more efficient because the implementation, you know, isn't creating continuations all over the place, isn't creating uh, procedures representing continuations that are heap allocated and that kind of thing. So you can choose to treat some recursive functions as simple, even though, you know, and if you didn't have some understanding of why they're simple, you would have to treat them as serious. So maybe, maybe this is similar. Um, okay. So I started looking at some other things. Okay. So here's the iron scheme, uh, repo. Nice. And we looked at R6 RS, uh, yesterday for going further. Uh, so I, I started, sorry, going further. I, I looked at Kent's book, the scheme programming language, um, fourth edition, just to see if there's any discussion of, of this. And there is a little bit. Um, as discussed in section 2.8, some recursion is essentially iteration and executes as such. When a procedure call is in tail position, see below, you know, this is a discussion similar to what we had yesterday. With respect to a Lambda expression, it is considered to be a tail call and scheme systems must treat it properly as a go-to or a jump. Mm. When a procedure tail calls itself or calls itself indirectly through a series of tail calls, the result is tail recursion. Because tail calls are treated as jumps, tail recursion can be used for indefinite iteration in place of the more restricted iteration constructs provided by other programming languages without fear of overflowing any sort of recursion stack. Okay, so this is interesting. So now we're talking about recursion stack and we're talking about go to and jumps. Um, I think part of, <laughs> part of the issue of writing a report like R6RS is that there are concepts that an implementer of a system needs to know about, such as like, hey, they're real computers and they're real processors that have real CPUs and that have registers and stack pointers and program counters and maybe frame pointers. And that that the scheme implementation is going to be running on those, those implementations. However, those details change and there are many computers and <clears throat> scheme has been ported to all sorts of architectures and there's been custom hardware you know, there's, there was a scheme processor that was built. Um, so this, the report doesn't want to get into all of those details and say, we assume there is one stack pointer and there's one frame pointer and that there's, there are in registers available and, you know, whatever that the report is at much higher level than that. And in fact, at least for our five RS, and I think this is true for our six RS, there's no uh, requirement 
that a scheme implementation implement garbage collection, for example. The spec is carefully written that to allow an implementation to reclaim memory that can no longer be reached, but that doesn't mean the implementation has to do that. You could just have enough RAM to not run out of, of memory and then you're fine. Um, and R5 RS doesn't talk about a REPL. I don't think R6 RS does either. So even though basically every scheme I've ever seen has a read eval print loop, um, you know, I don't think that's part of the spec and the exact behavior of a read eval print loop depends on the implementation. So there are just things that are outside the scope of what R5 RS, R6 RS um, talk about. And, you know, here Kent is using terms that as far as I can tell, do not appear in R6 RS, like talking about go to. Well, scheme doesn't have go to. There's no go to in scheme um, or jumps. You know, these are like assembly language jumps uh, or recursion stacks. There's no mention to my knowledge of things like recursion stacks in R6 and certainly not in R5. Um, and so these are concepts that an implementer of a programming language is almost certainly familiar with, but which in some sense are, are outside the scope of talking about the implementation. Um, so uh, just thinking about this more, I think that's really what's going on with the report. Um, so, you know, I was expecting to see the super uh, precise specification, and I think it's just not there. Uh, by the way, yeah, there's more discussion of recursion, but I didn't see anything really in detail there. Uh, and I also looked at R four RS um, just to see if they talk about proper handling of tail calls. Uh, they have this sentence by re relying entirely on procedure calls to express iteration. Scheme emphasize the fact that tail recursive procedure calls are essentially go tos that pass arguments. Okay, so this sentence I think may be in R six. Well, yeah, let's just check. Let's just check to see. If, um, you know, see if it's in the index. So I think just at that level, is, which is just like the very high level discussion language. Um, do, do, do. Okay. All right. This may not be the optimal way. Okay. Overview of scheme. Uh, I don't see go to mentioned in this one, so it looks like they may have removed that. What about tail? Okay, so they do talk about properly tail recursive um, in R6. So, so R4 RS literally had the word go to in the report. Um, R6, as far as I can tell, doesn't. Okay. Now, <clears throat> At this point, I started looking at some of the papers. So, so I, I started looking at this R, or sorry, this uh, PLDI um, 1998 paper by Will Klinger about proper tail recursion and space efficiency. And so, interestingly enough, he's talking about this IEEE version of Scheme from 1991, and. And this was the one I talked about before where you actually had to buy the spec. You had to buy that version of it. Um, and in that, it says, implementations of scheme are required to be properly tail recursive. STE 78. Well, okay, so this is referring to Steel 78. All right, well, now let's look at Steel 78. So Steel 78 is a very famous technical report from the MIT AI lab by Guy Steele. Um, Guy Lewis Steele, Jr. And uh, it's on Rabbit. You know, this is, I think, one of the more famous master's theses, certainly in programming languages. This is a master's thesis, not a PhD thesis. A compiler for Scheme. Um, and this is, uh, a, you know, Aziz told me this is very nice to read. And so I was skimming through it a little bit. Um, I, I study and compiler optimization based on viewing Lambda as rename and procedure call as go to. Okay, so this is all talking about um, how you can view uh, procedure call and a language like Scheme as a type of go to. And all right, so 
this is a little bit long, but as soon as I started getting into that, I thought, oh yeah, well, there's the Lamb of the Ultimate Papers, of course, which are very famous. And so there's one that's uh, subtitle is Lambda the Ultimate Go-To. I said, okay, well, let me look at Lambda the Ultimate Go-To, which is from 1977. Uh, AI Memo 443. Okay, debunking the expensive procedure call. And uh, yeah, so I thought this was interesting. This is an annotated version of a paper to be presented at the ACM National Conference, ACM 77. Well, now nowadays we've got at least four major conferences for programming languages. So, you know, ICFP, Popple, uh, Oopsla slash Splash, um, and PLDI. But back in 1977, there was the ACM National Conference. I mean, at this point, I think NeurIPS already attracts like 10,000 people or something uh, just for the, you know, neural machine learning type thing. So I can't imagine having a single national conference, say in the United States, for all of computing. I mean, you know, supercomputing, I think, attracts 10,000 people a year, at least. Uh, they just can't find venues big enough for these for these meetings. So, But in 1977, I guess there was a national conference and people presenting on programming languages and compiler optimizations would go to the national conference. Found that interesting. And so this... this uh, paper is relatively short and uh, has this nice discussion as procedure calls as go-to statements. So I actually, you know, just kind of dove into this one. And so it compares Fortran with um, some dialect of Lisp. And then it talks about compiling um, a function. So like, let's, let's uh, compile this function. All right. And it, says that we've got a jump, <clears throat> okay, so we've got a jump or like a go-to, okay, so jump or go-to if you've done assembly or, you know, go-to if you've used basic or many other programming languages has go-to. So a jump, in my mind, is something that's just going to change the stack, or sorry, the um, uh, program counter or the instruction pointer, what, what instruction is next to be executed. So this is just a direct jump. Um, there's also this push J where it pushes a location uh, probably onto the stack if it's if it's really pushing. Probably not in a register, but it's pushing um, some location onto the register like a return address. And then pop, pop an address from the stack and branch there. So these are the three operations that that guy is assuming that the architecture supports, and this is like on a PDP, you know, similar to a PDP-10 machine language. So this is sort of like an abstract machine language. Um, you know, you can map this to x86 or ARM or 68,000 or whatever you want. Um, okay, and so here is the code. And he talks about this code. And uh, the nice part is you know, so we have these nested calls. So here we have to, you know, in order to evaluate the body of this procedure, you know, the, the body of the procedure, sorry, to compile, not evaluate, to compile the body of that procedure, we have to compile this call to F, which is a tail call. That's a, in tail position. It's the, um, in the body of the, the lambda, nothing around it. And, um, but to call F, we need to know the value of G of X and we need to know the value of each of y. Um, now here he's evaluating left to right um, for these for these expressions. So so he's going to uh, do a call to g, setting up x as an argument, and then for the return address of this call, he's going to uh, have the return address point to um, a function that sets up h and calls to h. You know, sets up y. For h makes a call to h basically these are go-to's or jumps and then the return address of calling to h is going to be some code um, that sets up sets up f with with the values returned from the g of x and the h of y calls and then the interesting thing here is you don't have to set up a special uh, return address for f because f is a tail call so uh, so he's he's showing that that actually these procedure calls are effectively jumps or go-tos where you just do a little bit of work 
you know, to, to, to set things up, but you don't have to build like giant stack frames and activation records and have all this sort of bookkeeping. So he, he complains about how, um, on some architectures and some compilers, like, you know, uh, three, six system, IBM system, 360, that their PL one optimizing compiler, you know, allocated like 300 some bytes for a procedure call on the stack. And it's like, that's not necessary. Actually, you can just do a tiny amount of things like set up the arguments for G. Well, in this case, say, you know, X is a variable reference. Okay, that seems pretty simple. And then we're going to do this push J G where push the, um, you know, uh, let's see, we're going to set up the arguments for G push j g okay so push j is going to push location of the push j um, plus one on the stack and then branch location x okay and then save the result from g so it looks like we're going to uh, basically push a return address you know jump to g execute it with with the argument we set up like the x and then it will return here once G is done. And, and so now we're in bar one, we're gonna save the results from G, set up the arguments for H, H is gonna take Y, set that argument up. And now we're gonna do a push uh, J of H. So we're gonna to jump to H and then when H returns, we're in bar two. And then we're gonna use the results from G and H for F. So, you know, set up the arguments for F, maybe put those in registers or whatever is necessary. Um, you know, reuse the stack uh, for that information. And now we're going to, uh, you know, uh, call out to F. And then uh, once that returns, then pop off um, that uh, address from the stack and branch there. So, okay. Uh, duh, duh, duh. I think I basically am grokking this. Um, but yeah, you know, this is the sort of thing where you know if you if you follow these references, um, you know, for R six, R six points to this paper from nineteen ninety five, and that paper from nineteen ninety five points to the IEEE scheme spec from nineteen ninety one that you actually can't get your hands on, and that scheme spec has uh, you know describes proper tail calls by pointing to uh, the rabbit. Uh, thesis where he talks about that. It'd be nice to have like a searchable version of this, by the way. Um, this is 282 pages. Um, and But I'm sure in this document, it's going to be similar sorts of examples. And you're going to have to, at some level, understand this concept in terms of some abstract, uh, you know, machine language or abstract machine. And you know, notions of jumps and pushes and, you know, stack frames and program counters, all those sorts of things and labels and labeled jumps or whatever. Um, so our R6RS doesn't want to get into this. It doesn't want to talk about activation records explicitly or talk about jumps and go-tos and assembly language. Um, so instead it's pointing you to go something to go read uh, so, you know, that, that is just the way R6 is written. R5 was written that way. R4 was written that way in terms of they're not going to try to define everything that you might need to know. Um, they're going to assume that you know these, that you understand enough as a programmer outside the context of the spec that you'll be able to go chase these references down. And if you really want to understand it and you want to understand the optimizations, that you can go read a bunch of papers or read some compiler books or, you know, follow a tutorial and implement your own scheme compiler and try applying these tricks and so go off and, you know, read ICFP papers or PLDI papers or nowadays scheme workshop papers maybe and see how people do this or go look at the code for an actual compiler and, and see how they do it. Um, as far as the efficiency part of this, okay, once again, they don't, get into the details here a lot of 
reading between the lines with the scheme report is, you know, the, the report is worded in such a way that someone who understands how to do optimizations isn't prevented from doing optimizations or someone who wants to implement garbage collection isn't prevented from doing garbage collection. The, the uh, report will allow the garbage collection to happen and written in such a way that allows it, but maybe doesn't require it. And so that's been something true for scheme implementations and scheme uh, specification for a long time is that if you want to do this heroic, super smart compiler approach, fine. If you want to implement something much simpler, that's fine as well. Um, and I remember talking to Aziz and Aziz made a distinction between tail calls and tail call optimization and proper handling of tail calls. So to him, tail call optimization didn't mean you handled tail calls properly. That was just required by the spec that you handled tail calls properly. And and the way the way he explained it or Kent explained it was, you know, you wouldn't use an unbounded amount of stack space if uh, you're doing tail calls. So, but the optimization part is different. So to Aziz, the optimization part was about making the tail calls fast, which I think is what this comment is saying as well that there are some times where uh, a, a compiler or an implementation could do things either in terms of the implementation and the data structures, all that, or by recognizing that certain uh, calls that could be just treated as a tail call in a uniform way, you know, don't actually have to be treated as a tail call because, you know, we can prove that um, there's just going to be a finite number of stack frames allocated by that call. And in that case, the compiler doesn't have to, or the, the interpreter wouldn't have to, um, you know, do the proper handling in the sense of actually, you know, going through the process of doing the tail calls, but it could just treat that call as like a primitive, um, just like a, a, a normal programming language might. So uh, there, there is a distinction at least to some scheme implementers between tail call optimization and proper handling of tail calls. So if I really wanted to go down this rabbit hole further, then I would do something like maybe go through Jeremy Seek's uh, new book on, I think it's Essentials, a compilation from MIT Press, which is you know part of a long line of compiler courses offered at Indiana, uh, going back for decades. And you know, show, uh, we'll, we'll talk about proper handling of tail calls, I'm sure, and show you how to implement that. Uh, there's also Aziz Goulom's tutorial on how to write um, a scheme compiler. So that might be something worth looking at. Uh, you could see how Aziz talks about this. But, you know, I guess part of the interesting thing is if you think about in terms of programming language specification, there are certain things that for scheme specification, the authors of the report are saying, we're not going to get on all these details. We are going to underspecify scheme, partly so that different implementers can do different things and scheme can run on different hardware. We're not going to try to, you know, uh, specify every single thing. And we just assume that you're going to be clever and smart and well-read and that you're going to go off and read all the papers you need to, or, you know, maybe you have... Uh, maybe you have a PhD in computer science and you went to one of the scheme schools or a LISP schools and you know all this stuff. Okay, great. If not, you know, you're going to have to read a lot or you have to figure it out. Um, so that's kind of the way this is written. Uh, like I said, R5 doesn't really say anything about the REPL, doesn't um, doesn't require you to do garbage collection, has almost nothing. I think there's one sentence in R5RS that can be interpreted as having to do with garbage collection. Um, R6 might be similar. So, you know, that, that's also interesting at the level of writing the spec. What isn't specified or what, what is said just with enough information to not tie the hands of the implementer. And then here's a reference if you want to go off and, you know, go wild, that kind of thing. All right. Well, thank you very much for this comment. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if I can go any deeper on this issue. Uh, maybe I'll look at Aziz's stuff. Maybe I'll look at Jeremy's stuff. But I think the point is... You know, we're starting to get outside of what's in the report and start getting, and we're starting to get into uh, optimization and actually implementing it for a concrete architecture 
an instruction set and all those sorts of real world issues, which is really outside the the uh, ballywick of the report in many ways. Thank you very much. Uh, talk to you soon.